If you haven't been with us recently or ever, we are studying the first epistle of Peter to the church. So if you turn to 1 Peter this morning, we're going to be looking at verses, uh, chapter 4, verses 12 through 19. We will be in this epi- epistle of Peter's for two more weeks after today, uh, and then we'll wrap up and start heading into uh, the beginning of our Advent. Can you believe that it's Advent almost? <laughs> The time when we are so thankful that God loved us so immensely that he sent his son that we might be saved. A savior is born. There is so much to cover in this idea of persecution uh, for the sake of Jesus Christ. There, do, I tell, uh, do I tell a good Bible story? Do I bring our attention to Stephen as he's martyred for Jesus Christ? The first Christian to give his life for his relationship with Jesus? And do we focus on how he looked to the heavens and, and said, I see Jesus at the right hand of God as he's dying? And then to utter the same words that Jesus uttered on the cross, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Do we look at this idea of persecution? It's not a new phenomena at all. Uh, Not only did it happen during the days of Jesus, but it happened hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus. Do we talk about the the four little Hebrew boys that were captive in Babylon and and were told to to serve the king? (laughs) And uh, and their names were were, uh, Daniel, who was thrown into a lion's den for his prayer, (laughs) similar to Richard being beaten. Or do we talk about Shadrach, Meshach, and Asbestos. If you don't know this story, it was really Abednego, but I'm pretty sure it was an asbestos covering (laughs) that protected them when they were thrown in the fiery furnace for refusing to worship the image of the king because there is only one king and his name is God. Do we talk about some of the stories that we could look at in the Voice of the Martyrs magazine And by the way, all of you can take one of these home with you when you leave this morning. We have them out to give to you. And it'll just kind of chronicle a few stories of what's happening today in our world. But also the the story of Richard Wormbrand, uh, Tortured for Christ, the video that we saw. Uh, We have a timeline in here to kind of give you an idea just how long he encountered persecution for Jesus Christ and I encourage you to take that home with you and and read it and pray for the people who are facing persecution I entitled the message this morning we are so full of ourselves <laughs> you know if you got to have to stick with me long enough to have that title make any sense but the idea that the persecution is indeed real here as well and we'll get to that in just a moment but let's turn our attention to what Peter writes to the church universal this letter that went to all the churches as the gospel and the proclaimed Word of God Peter writes in 1st Peter chapter 4 verses 12 through 19 he writes to the church dear friends do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the suffering of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when His glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the Spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief, uh, or any kind of criminal or even a meddler, However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear the name. For it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And it is, if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then... Those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. We are nearing the end of this letter to the churches. 
And most of what Peter has been saying all through these four chapters and toward the end of this letter is about suffering for Christ's sake. In chapter 3, you see Peter talk about suffering for doing good. In chapter 4, he says, since Christ suffered, have that same mindset and be ready to suffer as well. Now we hear Peter say, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. And then he throws this caveat. And if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear his name. Certainly, Peter writes as one who understands suffering. He, just 30 years before, he saw the Apostle James put to death because of his relationship with Jesus. And Peter was imprisoned when James was killed. And Peter was going to be killed the next day. Can you imagine being aware of what Peter was aware of 30 years earlier of what it meant to, to be a, fo a follower of Jesus Christ? And at the time that he writes this letter, if you remember that we talked about, it was during the reign of Nero, the emperor, who was so against Christians that he used to actually have Christians put upon crosses and set them on fire to be lights into the city of Rome. Peter's writing at a time when he knows the intensity of persecution is increasing and it's not long before he himself will die for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you remember Peter died crucified like Jesus, only upside down? He just didn't believe he should be crucified in the same manner as his Savior. Now we hear Peter say, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed. But praise God that you bear that name, Jesus I have found this to be true in my life as a preacher that I tend to preach about the pressing stuff going on all around me. <laughs> What's going on around Peter? He's speaking to the church about ever-increasing persecution for being a Christian and the suffering that follows, follows that commitment. Persecution hasn't ended in our world. It's still happening all around the world today. And you saw that in the little video clip that you watched. I hope that you will want to take home that book, Tortured for Christ. I think we have 20. We'd be more than glad to buy as many as would be wanted by our congregation. And we just are aware that, that these, these stories are... are relevant to what's going on in our lives today around the world but persecution also occurs from sectors of humanity from nations such as uh, communist nations uh, those that tend to purport atheism there is no god why do you pray the 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 jail keeper said to Richard, why do you pray to a, an imaginary God? There is no God. I would love to tell you stories from Ravi Zacharias, who has been all around the world dealing with this area of persecution, not only, uh, not only blatant persecution in communist nations and in atheistic environments, but also kind of the, uh, the, the concealed attack against Christianity, much of what takes place in our nation. Persecution occurs from sectors of humanity, such as atheism, like I mentioned, or from agnostics, those that... Well, they're not going to go as far as to say, well, there is no God, but you've got to prove it to me. I can't, I just can't follow something that can't be proven to me. Or from secular humanism. In those cases, the attack against Christianity is not perpetuated by another religion attempting to eradicate a vying religious teaching, the attack comes from a point of view denying the reality of God at all. Communism or atheism, agnostics, and even secular humanism. All of those tenets are out there trying to proclaim to us 
that there is no God, that man is God. And I say to you this morning, we are so full of ourselves. I mean, I think of the scripture that says, the wisdom of the wise is but the foolishness of God. I'm amazed at all the things that we can do. I witness all kinds of things every day, and I just kind of go, Lord, I can't believe it. Hey, did any of you buy the new phone this week? Anybody? Raise your hand. Come on, if you did. Anybody? Okay, well, that's good. We're O for whatever that is. Nobody bought the new phone today I, or this week. I heard it cost $1,000 to buy, and there were people that were in line to buy them ahead of time and camping out and all that kind of stuff. You know, it sounds a little Black Friday-ish kind of thing to me. Um, but they were in line to get their phone. And, and then I heard, I couldn't believe this, but I heard that this phone that costs around $1,000 has a really uh, fancy component to both the front and the back side of it. It's like a glass covering. It's so, I mean, it's just really nice, I guess. But... Do any of you ever drop your phone? Like often? You know, hey, can I just show you something? I have run over my phone before trying to get rid of this thing because I am so archaic. I keep this as a historical reference to a day gone by. I pull this out and show young people and they go, what is that? I said, it's a teleporter. Beam me up. But this phone that costs a thousand dollars and we've got to have it. That's the cry of so many people. We've got to have the latest improv, uh, you know, piece of this technological advance. If you drop that and break either the back or the front, it costs eight hundred dollars to fix it. Do you know how many of these you can buy for eight hundred bucks if you can still find them? bunch <laughs> this this uh, oh this this advanced age in which we live in um, has indeed been a part of the impact against Christianity in a certain way let me just explain we have come to a point in time when we are so enlightened that we have this, this confidence in our own ability to understand our world and in our ability to accomplish anything technologically that is in front of us. We'll figure it out. Um, we have this confidence in our own ability that if anything happens medically, we're going to be able to address it. I, I just want to say to you, uh, not only did I witness this, this um, kind of news story about this new phone, but I, I witness all the time, every week almost, I witness something medically that's going on. Um, whether it be going to pray with somebody before surgery, or going to visit somebody that's having some kind of procedure done, or it might just be watching another episode of House. And the reason I watch House is because David Shore wrote it and produced it. And I love seeing my name in lights. Because <laughs> I am so full of myself. <laughs> this, this medical advancement, things can be done nowadays that just kind of make you shake your head at the advanced ability of medical sciences to do things. And yet I say to you that we scratch our head and go, I don't know how to do so many things. The body is such an intricate <laughs> creation. As much as we know, we recognize there's so much we don't know. Or, or possibly we are advanced scientifically uh, where we can study things and, and see so far out into the galaxy that we can identify so many different constellations and so many different... And I, I, I've watched some things trying to explain God scientifically from the stars and all that kind of stuff. And I've watched it I, talking about Lanham. Lanham, Lanham. Lanham, thank you, Bob. You're my man. Would you come to the second service too in case I struggle? 
Which, and, 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 and this description of, of how immense the universe is and, and how things fall in line and there's intelligent congruence in what has happened in the universe. We can see so many things out there. And then I say to you, we can't even begin to fathom the size of this universe and the things that we understand just make us want to know more. I understand how all these things work. Well, actually, I don't understand how any of them work, but I understand how they play out in our society and how we depend upon them and how we are marveling at the abilities that we have. But I think the problem is not in our advanced development, but the problem is in the devalued place of God. And in the elevation of ourselves to do things that we cannot do. So this enlightenment has been a portion of the problem that has led to some persecution in the Western culture. But I think if you were really to push me, I would say that I think the reason that Persecution is real in our nation is because we are theologically compromised. Western society has adopted a lot of different things like all religions are basically the same. Therefore, all of them are viable before God. I think that we have come to a place where we are gleaning our theology from, let me just say this, ignorant, ignorant sources. <laughs> now, let me clarify this. Ignorant is not the same as stupid. Okay? And let me just tell you, I had a music teacher in high school who used to look at, at the a cappella choir and he says, you people are ignorant. And we would all go, he just called us stupid. And he goes, see, that's exactly what I mean. It doesn't mean stupidity. It means lack of knowledge. And the ignorance of things like Hollywood. Have you watched a Hollywood presentation of something biblical? Have you watched any of that stuff? You would be amazed at some of the things that take place in Hollywood descriptions of biblical things. Morgan Freeman has a series on called the, uh, the Case for God, not the Case for God or something. Anyhow, what is it? No, that's Lee Strobel, but that's a good one. Now see, this, you can talk back to me anytime you want because I get lost, period. The story of us. Thank you. And then it's also, he also has one called the story of God, where he tries to describe things that you and I would not recognize from Scripture. Oh, really? And in the great Hollywood presentations, uh, such as the, the story of Noah, did you know that there were all kinds of rock-like supernatural creatures fighting off the people who were trying to get in the ark? Or maybe another story where we find out that Noah's, this was an earlier version, but Noah's on the ocean and it's just Noah and his family and the, and the animals that are floating through. And then all of a sudden, here comes a raft full of people. And you know who was on that raft? Lot. I'm not kidding. And he was on there and they are all coming up to the ark and so that they would not be saved, a typhoon comes down and sweeps them up and takes them to heaven. Well, or takes them somewhere. They're out of the picture. And you sit there and you, you think, what a fascinating story. I hope no one's believed in this. Because 
there's a whole lot of stuff that's being projected through our society that has nothing to do with a biblical reality at all. Could I challenge you to do something? Read the Bible. How archaic <laughs> to read something that some have dismissed as irrelevant today. Oh, you don't have to believe all the Bible. Just, just pick out the parts you like. <laughs> it's kind of the mentality of many. Ignorant sources. I, I really don't want Hollywood or movie production companies or the media or a, 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 an actor or an actress or somebody that is not qualified. I don't want them to tell me about God. Some of you might think, I'm not sure I want you, Pastor, to tell me <laughs> about God. And I would say, good, find out yourself. Read the Word. Don't, let, don't even let the church be the only Bible you read. In Envelop yourself in the Word of God. Take it home and begin to study it. Begin to let it speak to you. The Spirit of God will open your mind and teach you the reality and the truth of God. And then I pray that we come alongside that and speak accurately to what the Word of God is saying. I pray that our student ministries are doing that accurately with the children and teens of this church. Do not depend upon anyone to do the job that is yours, moms and dads. But we come alongside to be a companion in teaching the Word of God. I want you to be aware that there was no intent to be... Uh, unkind by saying what I did about the ignorance of how we learn many things. The result of getting information from the wrong source is a messed up story and a theologically compromised mind. The antidote, read the word. But could I say one more thing at the risk of sending you home happy? Who would want that? Let me just throw one more source out there and just make sure that you know what I'm thinking about this. We are also influenced by a lot of homespun opinions. Here we go. Twitter, Snapchat, Facebook, whatever else people use to connect, the opinions that fly on social media are constantly upon us. They are on us like this. In fact, there might be some people doing that right now going, oh, here he goes. Didn't he just talk about meddling? You know, you can even do that on this. I know you don't believe it. It's just that I have to actually type it. Oh, you people that just do this. Dave, period. Get on with the message, period. My wife has one of those, and so does my daughter-in-laws, and, and they send me messages this long, and you know how long it takes me to type a message back to them? I just want to say, please, just shoot me now. Hey, how about Colin? I'll actually talk to you if you want to. <laughs> in an instant, in an instant, information can be put out over the social media and a lot of it just is crazy. Do you ever get that impression? Do you ever read some of those things and go, oh my, what happened to them? How did they come to that conclusion? And, and then you look at the results and there's 50 people who like it. And, oh, man, there's 50 people who like this. Are you kidding me? 
Now, I think that we should all stay connected. I do. I, it, it's a great way to stay. You know, my three-and-a-half-year-old grandson lives five hours from me, and I hate that. It just, it's just not close enough. And my six-year-old granddaughter lives 40 minutes away from me, and that's barely close enough. And I love the idea of staying connected. I love staying connected with, with you guys when you post things and say things and mention things that are going on. It just makes me, it makes me feel like I'm kind of up to speed with you. I, I say stay connected. But I also would just would ask you to be careful that you just don't take every thought that comes down the line as being valid and true. You might want to just be slow in response to some of the things that we read. Here's my point. My point is this. We live for God who gives us His Holy Spirit to open up our minds to allow us to discern what is or is not biblically, theologically correct. And we live in a Western society now that pushes in on us in every way so that we might compromise our beliefs. And the persecution that is coming to the church has a lot to do with the compromised beliefs of a people who once upon a time had a firm understanding of what God's Word says. I think that's why Peter said, if we're going to have success, it's going to start with the people of God. Again. In closing, Wednesday night, we showed a film uh, called Pastor to the People. It's the story of Phineas Brzee and how he began, he, he came from being a Methodist pastor to becoming the first pastor in the Church of the Nazarene back in 1895 in Los Angeles, California. And and at one point in 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 the story, Phineas Brzee is sick, very sick, and he's lying in bed, he's tormented, and his wife is trying to care for him, and and he's just talking. Some would think, oh, he's just talking out his head because he's got a fever. He's just sick. And he's talking about how all of this life means nothing. He's done all of these things and they've accounted for nothing. And what have I accomplished, he says to his wife. And she just continues to care for him. And the next scene has him standing in front of his church, a Methodist church in Iowa. And he's preaching the word of God. And he makes a statement in front of the church and then all of a sudden, and this is always kind of a little wiggy, when the pastor stops talking, when the one that's supposed to be preaching just all of a sudden stops and just stares at you, kind of like, I'm uncomfortable now. (laughs) What are you going to do? He makes a statement about the Holy Spirit enlightening our minds, opening us up, transforming us, and he just stops in mid-sentence. And he falls to his knees after a moment and just began at 57, right around 57 years of age, he had an epiphany where the Holy Spirit of God came in and worked in his life in a a dynamic he had never experienced before. There's, There's something amazing. There's something amazing about God having access to the hearts of his followers that changes the course of history. The great revivals have always come when someone who is a prominent leader falls on their face and says, Oh God, I haven't been what you wanted me to be. I haven't been faithful. All of this has been this pursuit toward myself and my own glory and my own advancement and and all the accolades that I could do and I'm so driven and I want to be. To come to the realization, 
that it's not about who you are and what you do and the accolades you receive and the degrees and the church assignments and all of the pursuit that gets in the way. It is about the transformation of your soul that radiates in the life of Jesus Christ and everything then begins to come together when you, when you are awakened by God. If we're going to have a spiritual renewal in the life of America, if we're going to have a revival in the life of America, again, it's going to be because it starts with us. The people of God who recognize that all the things that I have reached for are nothing. And the fulfillment that I have, no matter what it might bring, it might bring ridicule. <laughs> Some might look at me and go, oh, that's so, so idealistic. Or it might really bring antagonism from someone you love. Or it might not square with what happens in our educational systems nowadays. We might, we might find persecution becoming more blatant toward us, but the reality is persecution is not our problem. Our problem is falling on our face before Jesus and standing for his name. No matter what it brings. We see the videos and we think, oh dear God, please protect them. We recognize that there's a banner in the foyer that says there are ten ways to pray for the persecuted church. Pray that they see that they sense God's presence in the persecution. Pray that that they will experience God's comfort during the persecution. Pray that God would open doors to evangelistic pursuit during the persecution. Pray that they would boldly share the gospel. Pray that they would forgive and love their persecutors. Pray that, that, they, that they would know that we are praying for them. Pray that they remain joyful in, amidst their suffering. Pray that they mature in their faith. Pray that they will remain rooted in God's word and pray that God grant them wisdom even if they are involved in covert ministries around the world. That's what we've been asked to do for those who are persecuted this day. But my prayer is that we will also remember to pray for ourselves that we be all of those things amidst the persecution that is real in this nation that we live. Oh, I think I'm, I think I've unloaded my gun. And some of, some of the, I probably wished I left some of the bullets still in there. But I think, I think that God would honor us on our faces before him. And maybe we too would catch a new glimpse of Jesus arbitrarily representing us, or maybe not arbitrarily, mandated to represent us before the Father huh. interceding on behalf of the church. Father, this day is the day that you have given us to worship and rejoice, to have grateful hearts and to enter into your courts with thanksgiving and praise. And we have. We are so grateful for what you have done. But oh, Father, 
Could you open our eyes up to see you? Could you, could you somehow challenge us to hear what the Spirit says to the church? And may we never fear the evil one. For greater is he that is in me than he who is in the world. We pray this day, Lord Jesus, that as we, as we keep our eyes upon you, that you will perfect, Lord Jesus, our faith. Faith to encounter anything that comes our way. To believe, Lord Jesus, along with the Apostle Paul, I know in whom I believe. And I am persuaded, God, that you are able to keep that which I commit against you. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for keeping me today. Now, Lord, bless us, I pray. Amen. Church, receive this blessing. May you go as people who have a passion and a desire to know our God more. May that push you to be a people who dive into God's word, God's love letter to us. And as you do, may you go in the grace and the peace of Christ. Amen.